Britain was a donation by a gentleman called John Arnold Breedenkamp, a conservative covert weapon supplier um, who dealt with uh, many people in the covert arms trade, including Oliver North and uh, various South African special forces and UK SAS members who form uh, private military companies. So, Lord Doug Hoyle, uh, on behalf of Andrea Davison, wrote to the chief of the Army police to try to expedite her case as quickly as possible. Okay, thank you for that. We'll go back now to, to the Williamson page of my website, if you can just access that. And you can explain how vigorously you've tried to get these things into the public eye. Maybe starting with your visit to the Derby Police on the 15th of February 2011. I've now got an image of that up as we make the video. So the okay. receipt, you were given an official receipt number for that from Louise Sarah Hawkins at the Derbyshire Constabulary. Constabulary. Yeah, that was, a, that was a joint visit by Peter and myself to gain access to information or uh, inquire about the Freedom of Information um, request that we would make to uh, uh, inform also the, the Derbyshire Police, to the Derbyshire Police, that we were involved in a civil litigation case against Andrea Davison when I made public other documents relating to massive fraud of which the Derbyshire Police with a, the Freedom of Information Officer who explained that our civil case should not go ahead of any criminal uh, case uh, put against Andrea Davison. And you were, you were corresponding with Chris Williamson at that time trying oh, yes, to get yes, these... I was making it known that um, within the documents that I presented to him in the personal visit that we had at the council houses, I gave him a folder file of 31 pages which showed the interrelationship between a convicted, oh sorry, then not convicted, but uh, facing criminal trial of a major fraud and document forger who acted on and for the Labour Party uh, and senior members of um, were by the documents that I presented to MP Chris Williamson were those of a political dynamic involving arms to Iraq documents and as an ex-serviceman I always carried a duty of care that if some of those documents were forensically accurate they contained uh, incidents of uh, details of missing nuclear warheads and that was some of the documents that were purportedly seized by the Derbyshire police of which I made a freedom of information request to understand that they were secure, those documents, and that they would be forwarded on towards the Chilcot inquiry. I received no reply, I, sorry, I received no confirmation from the Derbyshire police under that FOI request, only other than that these documents were under a certain clause, uh, subject to non-disclosure, uh, as there was an ongoing criminal investigation. However, under the, f under the proceeds of crime order that uh, the Derbyshire police used against or for the raid on Mr. Uh, Davison's property, it only covered the involvement of herself in a fraud between 2007 and 2008, and they expedited their removal of documents which far outstripped the, uh, the legality of their warrant under the proceeds of crime. And can Hence I just I read the reply around the same time on the 22nd of March from Chris Williamson to you on what you had asked him to take to the Prime Minister? Can I read that out for the public? Yes, of course, yeah. Dear Mr Bowden, please find enclosed two letters I have sent on your behalf these include a letter to the Prime Minister with which I enclosed your correspondence and then a further chase-up letter 
when he did not respond. I don't think ongoing correspondence with you on this issue is particularly productive. As you will appreciate, I have over 700,000 other constituents... No, it's 70,000. So, sorry, 70,000 other constituents in Derby North, and many of them contact me with pressing personal concerns. Remember that the last issue he has taken forward to Hansard is, to the, is on the abuse of Nigerian children in another country under the regime of another government. I am sorry that you have not secured the outcome you desired on this issue. Yours sincerely, Chris Williamson, Labour MP for Derby North. Yeah, my, my concerns with this were, one, it didn't cover the issues or the documents that I forwarded to him in a uh, file and those documents were recorded as duplicates of others. And so Chris Williamson looked for a, an avenue... But there was no signature on them, and there was no indication of whether or not it had actually been sent to the Prime Minister's office? Exactly, and I asked Chris Williamson to provide me with copies of those letters that he forwarded to the Prime Minister. How convenient and that he's forgotten well, he refused, to put a signature on it? No, he refused. He refused to forward me those correspondence, okay. uh, which is an unconstitutional, uh, um, uh, how can I put it? Uh, it's a breach, breach of the UK constitution. Yeah, yeah, just not only a breach, it's uh, my mistrust of his involvement in uh, forwarding these political dynamic documents, which uh, should carry further disclosure to the general public. And this uh, this man is not fit to hold public office. I know him to be a complete and utter liar. He is he is a disgrace not only to the population of Derby, but to anybody within the Labour Party. And remember, New Labour were the regime that took us into war in Iraq, exactly, uh, with very little reference to democracy or the democratic process. You, you understand that um, politics is a dirty game and basically it's all about controlling a piggy bank. Um, unfortunately, within the Constitution, they have a league, uh, because they are public servants, um, if there was any information within those documents, which clearly there was, with personal letters between uh, senior members of the House of Lords and MPs, and including Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, and uh, Kenneth Clark, that these letters represented a, uh, a, an overview of corruption within the Labour Party, and Chris Williamson, for the sake of his own survival and that of senior members of the Labour government, refused to uh, um, forward my requests to the Conservative Prime Minister, David Cameron, who is just as corrupt as... The, the others. So that, that takes us further down the page. Can you scroll down and see, at this point you take us to a party political congress. I th believe it was in Nottingham, was it? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, uh, there was an invitation by certain members of the public in Derby to request tickets for this. And I saw this as an ideal opportunity to forward copies of those 31 pages um, to various senior members of the Labour Party. Uh, um, as you can see... And I've now just scrolled down to pictures of Gordon Brown and Tony Blair grinning like Cheshire cats on that theme. Uh, so yeah. can you explain what happened at that Congress and how you were responded to with your huge accusations? Well, uh, basically I took the two cover documents of which I recovered by access to f header bars on the front page of those two pages, uh, over 400 documents. Um, this is from Davidson's name. residence. That's correct. No, and our website. Her website, which was www.afbio.co.uk. And we put that URL on my website as a token yeah, gesture because the website has now been long since closed yes. down for access to the public? But as I explained to you, there are methods to recover those pages, which um, if anybody wants to recover them, 
you can see by using Internet Archive Wayback Machine, you can still access certain pages. However, most of the material has been removed and certain documents and files you cannot gain now access. However, but you're, you're pictured at the Labour Party conference in Nottingham yes. presenting all of the evidence from all of the documents that you got from the closed website. That's and can I just read out the statement that you make which is coincident with that? The reason he refused to cover my issues in Parliament were because they implicated very senior Labour Party politicians. Prime Minister Tony Blair, Prime Minister Gordon Brown, MP Neil Kinnock, MP Peter Hayne, Kenneth Clark, who's the longest serving Conservative Party cabinet member, Lord Laird Artigavan, I'm not sure if he has a party affiliation, and Lord Douglas Howell, who we've already seen Hoyle, Ho Hoyle who we've already seen some correspondence from on my web page. Can you tell us a little bit more about those senior Labour Party politicians? Yeah, the, the, the meeting was the Congress meeting for the new Labour Party, you know, to go forward with, uh, uh, with conviction, to tell the truth, to expose the, uh, the corruption in other parties, etc. However, as you can see, um, this, this uh, meeting I presented to Baroness Scotland uh, and various other senior member, uh, sorry, that's my, just my printer going off, um, to present the documents which you can see clearly, well you can't see clearly, but you can see from the second portrait shot when I handed it to certain uh, dictionaries that on the far top left hand corner of the page it's the same photograph as the document of the two pages that I sent you. Yes, and that, uh, just to explain to the public, we've already posted this stuff on the deceit and cover-up involving my MP, uh, Michael Moore, and Gordon's MP, Chris Williamson. The sub-page beyond that on my website will be high-resolution images of those documents or the evidence from Tara Davidson's website that has subsequently been obfuscated or is no longer available for public scrutiny and has been rejected as irrelevant by the politicians who committed the war crimes and the financial uh, grand larceny. Uh, so Gordon, we've got further down the page references to Baroness Scotland uh, and and to even the British press accusing Lord Doug Hoyle and Baroness Scotland of being profiteers in the kickbacks to politicians at Westminster sector. But keep profiling the roles in these major war crimes. So we've got Ed Miliband pictured with his brother further down the page. Yeah, that's correct. And uh, on uh, exiting that conference, uh, as we were walking back, uh, to the the bus park, um, I came across uh, Ed Miliband as he was walking with his secretary and reporters, etc. And he just happened to stop and shake my hand. At the same time, I passed a file of the same documents to his uh, cohorts that were with him. So I'm his sure administration he... received oh, yeah. all of those forty-page documents. No, all the four, 40 pages. It was um, a short brief of the documents that I'd recovered. Which is similar um, to what I sent yes, to the procurator, the procurator fiscal in Jedburgh yes. two weeks ago. He's confirmed yes. receipt of that with a signed yes. docket. Yes. Now, Thank you. Um, so what's happened is, uh, at that meeting, I'm, I made emphasis as an ex-member of Her Majesty's Forces any inferences of missing nuclear weapons or warheads should be a top topic of uh, national concern and I understand from the the, the uh, publication by Miss Davison that a missing nuclear warhead uh, is in concern with a uh, submarine servicing of missiles which went by road transport uh, back down to Red where it was to do, do for servicing 
where one lorry went missing in that convoy and that weapon, that warhead, was said to have been transited through uh, the Balkans. It was moved out of the country into the Balkans. And the source of that information was Andrea Davison and her resident, I believe, to be David William Mills, who worked at the nuclear weapons establishment. Can I just read some of the headers from the documents that were seized? Yes. My early history in exposing arms to Iraq. This is from Miss Davidson. Trade and yes. Industry Select Committee into Arms to Iraq and the Scott Inquiry. And I'll just add that the Scott Inquiry was conducted under University of Warwick rules. Would you like to explain that to the public, Gordon? Yeah, Warwick rules are those, there are injunctions made upon those giving evidence in a secrecy clause. That's what Warwick rules, sorry, Warwick so rules So basically are, they are given a script that they have to voice well, over during the inquest. What normally happens under Warwick rules is that this, uh, the, the, the inquiry is overviewed and the release of the report is already pre-written if you understand. Yeah. So it's like making a movie. You pick yes. your you pick the people who chair the, the inquest who just happen to be directors of the same companies with foreign secretaries in two thousand and two. We covered that in one of our earlier videos. Yeah. That's Chilcott, the arms to Iraq chair, who was a director with Malcolm Rifkind at Abraxa and dozens of other companies. That's correct. Yeah. Okay, That's and so that, that is the secrets that allowed our politicians and G8 politicians globally to crash the banks in 2008. So this is not just about war crimes and the cover-up of war crimes. It's about global economic fraud by Definitely. parliament buildings and their second chambers. Unfortunately for the general public, when you're looking at the Chilcot Inquiry, it's stalled because I have correspondence with the Chilcot Inquiry Secretary, which clearly state in their referral to me that they had no contact with Andrea Davison. However, I have a Derbyshire police report into the trial of Andrea Davison when she was convicted on the 25th of the 7th, 2012, where it clearly says that police investigated that documents showed that she did have contact with the Chilcot inquiry. So the, the one contradicts the, the other. Are we to believe the Derbyshire police or the Chilcot inquiry? And this is where I've attempted to gain clarity by um, objective communications with Chris Williamson, MP, right honourable. And can you profile the role of the lesser politicians like Kinnock and Hain? Ken Clark is quite notorious for his outspoken right-wing views on sexuality and rape in, within the UK cabinet, even within the current regime. And in the context of what's happening to children in Nigeria, uh, can you tell us how Kinnock and Hain and Lord Artigavan and Lord Doug Howell have been invo involved Hoyle. in these? Hoyle, it's sorry. Doug Hoyle. Yeah. Andrea Davison operated a boiler room in North Wales. She also operated a boiler room in London, in Vancouver, Canada, in Cyprus, Gibraltar, Rhodes Islands, and many other locations, and was part of a massive network that made false and fake uh, passports, ID documents, fake share certificates. And what the Derbyshire police uncovered was a treasure trove that went far beyond their capability and uh, uh, financial resources to investigate the major people above and beyond Andrea Davison. And this is where I get very angry with those people that allow the senior members of these fraud groups to get away with it. So, Lord Doug Hoyle and um, Peter Hain. Peter Hain fell into a close relationship with Andrea Davison, the convicted fraud, fraudster and forger, when she went 
to his constituency office in the past, in about 2010, I think it was. Um, no, it must have been before that, uh, where she was uh, with Pete Sawyer, the investigative journalist from Scallywag, Private Eye, and his own investigative journalist uh, company, to give um, MP Peter Hain document which he called for, Peter Hain called for, regarding missing nuclear warheads, which he then put in his safe. Now, Miss Andrea Davison, following her arrest and the seizure of the documents that she refers to in the four-page list, um, warned Peter Hain about their past meeting and the documents that he put in his safe. Now, under a duty of care, if that document concerned missing nuclear warheads, Peter Hain had a right, uh, uh, as a civil duty right, to expose those documents in Parliament. He refused because he refused to answer my emails. And that's because he is also a co-director in a Ponzi scam company called Amara Mining, which is a throwback from the morphed Clough Mining companies with Algae Clough, of which you know about. Uh-huh. And Lord so, Doug Hoyle has been accused of whoring himself to arms dealers, even by the British Free Press, on the front page of The Guardian, I'm led to believe. Yeah, that's correct. But the, the other people... Uh, Neil Kinnock, Andrea Davison was recommended by senior Labour Party members to go and see Neil Kinnock. And so this lady is, a well, is well known to the senior politicians, uh, including the letters which I recovered of uh, correspondence between her and Tony, uh, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. So we're back to the Labour Party. Yes. I've got images on that page about Williamson being a liar featuring Baroness Scotland and her capacity to make £7,500 a day to accuse, to advise leaders of military coups in the Maldives. Presumably if they've publicised that, it's relatively small beer in her criminal transcript. And the day that I published the page of the guillotine and accused Stephen Hester of the murder of a whistleblower within the RBS structure when he was with the Abbey National and Richard Chang was killed, yes. Ed Miliband's brother flew the country on the same day as an MP for Labour in Newcastle, which is a very poor sector of the northeast of England. Uh, but can you... Can you tell me a little bit more about the, the left-wing connections? Well, if you just go down to that same, scroll down to the one with uh, Baroness Scotland, yeah. uh, you'll see the one with Margaret Beckett and Chris Williamson uh, opposite each other, with, where Peter A. put a caption, uh, speech caption into it. Um, Would you like to read that out for the public? Yeah, well, naturally I knew about the money mentioned in Ansard, Gordon Bowden and Peter A came to see me, but not tactfully I pushed them on to Chris Williamson. And that's legitimately so, because um, I was a constituent of Chris Williamson, however... Like I am a constituent of Michael Moore, but we cannot correspond with them? Yeah, but she's, uh, Margaret Beckett still had a duty of care to disclose uh, in Parliament those documents, because she was fully aware of the 17.8 million... Uh, which was uh, laundered and uh, conduited into the empty Tory accounts uh, and because she was the person at the Department of Trade and Industry who interviewed the directors of Astra Holdings. Uh, and that, that was the delegation to South Africa that involved uh, David Kelly, the late David Kelly? No, that, uh, say that the, what she was made known and privy to was that in um, 1989, a young conservative, David Cameron, was uh, put in a jolly, you know, a paid free visit. Yeah, free holiday to Pelindaba. 
That's correct. To yeah. South Africa. And we've yeah. published the correspondence on that in the past. Yeah, with... Um, from the Conservative the, Policy Research Unit. Yeah, it was said to have been paid for by a front company um, with links to Arms Corps, um, which was registered in London, but it was a front of Arms Corps. And uh, the people said to have visited with David Cameron were the aeronautics engineer, uh, Ken, Sir Ken Warren, and the other person that went was said to have been Dr. David Kelly, who was found um, after suiciding himself on a hillside. But it is believed that the knowledge of the uh, visit to uh, uh, Palandaba, which is just north of Pretoria, in South Africa, was in order for a, um, a big covert uh, WMD arms uh, recovery of nine in-stock, ex-stock, uh, 20 kiloton battlefield-ready gravity drop nuclear bombs, which were developed at the secret nuclear facility in Palandaba. And one of the correspondents who was in touch with the Conservative Policy Unit was one Doug Hoyle. That's correct. Yeah. At, at that point on the war crimes and the trading, can you just remind me of the party affiliation of the late Robin Cook? Well, I, all I understand is that he had full access to these documents and would have known. And he was the only new Labour, Labour member who had the bottle to stand up and say, I do not want to go to war in Iraq. Oh, yes. Yeah. Can you remind I, me where Robin Cook is now? Well, unfortunately, he's pushing up the dick. He's yeah, in, he's in a cemetery. Yeah, well, like Dr. David Kelly. Uh-huh. And Dr. David Kelly's only motive for telling the truth was so that he could have a decent pension like the rest of the UK's civil servants. Correct. Yeah. Which brings me down to the images of senior Conservatives. We've done New Labour to death and various people who were in the New Labour cabinet who have been found in graveyards since, which takes us to senior Conservatives like Jonathan Aitken, yes. Mark Thatcher, BAE Systems, all linked to criminal covert arms trade to Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia. And you're having oh. trouble getting this into the attention zone of elected MPs in rural Derbyshire? Unfortunately for the general public, they have little understanding of how um, covert arms trading is conducted. People like Jonathan Aitken and Mark Thatcher were uh, co-directors in a company called BMARC, a Belgian arms production company. And I arms spelt that wrongly. It's B-M-A-R-C. Yes, BMARC. Okay. And that company uh, designed the uh, new version of a Gatling gun used, that used vast amount of ammunition um, fired at, at incoming low, uh, low height missiles as fired against uh, maritime shipping. Um, that company was subsequently acquired by Astra Holdings and the involvement of Jonathan Aitken and Mark Thatcher was obscured in that transaction because the person in charge of, or then had taken charge of um, Astra Holdings was a covert MI6 plant called uh, uh, Adolphus Cock. And this is exactly coincident with the time that Mrs. Thatcher signed a gagging order and very quickly got herself out of British politics? No, she was removed as a tactical uh, diversion uh, because I think that she knew that the game was up with regard to uh, covering up for BAE systems where this uh, the Al Yamama deal went ahead where uh, Mark Thatcher made a bundle um, of Wonga uh, in the deal with Hawks to the Saudi Air Force. Are you still scanning down my webpage for the liar Derby North? 
we've now got to the stage where the policing of our country is in the hands of elected commissioners and the next image tells us about the head of the Derby Council who is one Ranjit Banwe and the elected member of the D Derby Police Crime Commissioning Unit who is also a left winger in inverted commas his name is Alan Charles yeah I've got that scan um, Ranjit Banwe uh, a um, major turnover of the Labour Council he uh, they got rid of one of the the then head chair of the city council and Mr. Ranjit Banway, who is Chris Williamson's sidekick and Margaret Beckett's sidekick, was uh, inducted as the new leader. Um, yeah, I, there's a lot to be said about corruption in politics, but this one I think is should be investigated by a, a, an outside party, given the fact that they refused to discuss those documents and ran. Banwick was given copies of saying so he's fully aware and the creation of organizations like G4S which are progressively displacing ordinary British cops from ordinary British pavements can you explain some of the directorships at G4S and how people well, like Lord Condon are in charge of that well you've mentioned two of them didn't you uh, um, Rifkin uh, Rifkind, all interlocks with a select syndicate of people with very high profile positions in government. And Lord Condon was the chair of the Princess Diana fatal accident inquiry and found it to be exactly. an accident? Yes, they... they, they in France they found it to be an unlawful killing. Uh, but G4S now as a private initiative is displacing British police people from their jobs. You've talked yesterday about how G4S now collect the revenues for the parking system within the UK as the parkies lose their jobs as private individuals who are not military or police citizens within the police force. They occupy the same buildings but their jobs are tumbling en masse now in favour of a privately owned company that is run by former heads of the police service in metropolitan London. Exactly. A whole string of them. And exactly. by Malcolm Rifkind, who is a strong campaigner for the Better Off Together campaign, even although he has a strong Scottish accent and he lives in leafy Kensington, they're all on the board, they're all on the take, and they look ever so innocent when they publish their mug shots on Hansard. Well, they're all smiling because they, they, they're getting the cut. So that brings us to the bottom of that web page, but then we there's the brief mention of paedophilic Peter, Peter rings and the closure of the AF Bio website so that these scandals on war crimes and the economic crash of 2008 can be covered up both by our government and by our monarchies? Well, if you follow the, your webpage down, you will see the photograph of um, Andrea Davison with George Less, uh, sorry, Stephen Less, who runs the secret nightclubs in <laughs> London, the, the new d lap dancing clubs. Um, and he was a, a very close friend of Max Clifford. So when Andrea Davison fled pre her criminal trial, she met up with uh, Steve Less in Miami, where the photograph was taken, which I've sent to the Derbyshire police in a, an effort to get them to use the foreign office to recover this woman from Venezuela, where she's still working for the criminal organization doing exactly the same job as she was doing here. But when you're talking about political corruption, I'm sure that they would want this woman to remain in obscurity so that these people who you see in the uh, segment cuts of 
people like uh, um, Jimmy Savile, Tony Blair, and Lord Hardy, and Gordon Brown, Michael Portello, so that they can all breathe easy, much the same as they did with Azil Nadia in Polypec. But uh, I will use... Mandelson, Mandelson is not photographed. I don't know whether that means he's not a paedophile. But, no, well, I'm not, I'm not saying that. It's saying there's but the, the New Labour has. and the Conservatives overlap in every sector that your MP in Derby has chosen not to be an important sector, which is the brutalisation of innocent countries by NATO. We've got Lord Robertson pictured at the top of that page. He's the man who gave the gun licence to Hamilton yeah. in the Dunblane massacre. And you can see Lord Hardy and all the inquest chairs who cover up the evidence from that. You can see that Sir Jimmy Savile who was appointed a knight to Malta by the British fam royal family, is laughing his face off with Prince Charles, <laughs> who's the advisor to the criminal that we talked about at Lonru yesterday. Yeah, well, well, much the same is that when you look at those uh, scroll down on, on your website, uh, when you come to, to companies like uh, Malaria No More, that were received 15p in every uh, uh, phone call for I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. Very few people would look at the corporate registration of directors. And this is where um, I became uh, involved in uh, research to uncover how Andrea Davison was linked to certain directors and those being Rebecca Brooks, um, Kevin James Carr. That's Rebecca Brooks with 140 or so registered companies in the business directory. Not anymore, she hasn't. Most of them are No, she's bailed out for shame because oh, yeah. people like you are on the job now who do not get a salary or a pension from people like these. Tell us the story that you told me yesterday about being a non-executive director in either chamber in the parliament building if you earn a salary, let's say, something like £700,000. Tell me that story again. Well, a lot of the directors of uh, virtual oil, gas and mining companies are basically inducted to give the company a semblance of authenticity and respectability. However, when you research these companies in depth, as I have done with my mining experience, by recovering their... Um, documents that they have to file to register on the alternative investment market, that when you recover uh, the sometimes up to 500 pages of an AIM 26 admission to trade document, you notice that the directors, when they list their past and current directorships, you see that they have been directors of, of up to 100 fake virtual oil, gas and mining companies that have never produced one ounce of anything or a thimble full of oil and yet these people are allowed to re-register multiple other companies to trade and to uh, uh, have the ability to raise money uh, which is uh, from private investors, banks and financial institutes that then go on over a period of seven or ten years to asset strip the companies and banks by selling them worthless shares in virtual companies which are director only cash shells. So can I just profile briefly because we need to get to the top of the food chain and understand how this thing is run. Can I remind the people that Rupert Murdoch picks British MPs on a regular basis and that his daughter Elizabeth Murdoch is married to a Freud and they are members of a, the Prime Minister Cameron's drinking club in Chipping Norton. Former members include Ronnie Barker uh, and the current members include St Dunstan who's head of Carphone Warehouse, uh, Oppenheimers, Rebecca Brooks. Remember that David Cameron chose the chap who was the expert phone hacker, Andy Coulson. Uh, he is not in the Chipping Norton set to my knowledge but they are all in the cabal that steals from the people and we know the links to 
the Russia, the Future of Russia Foundation, which include directors like Henry Kissinger, members of the Rothschild family, and we know how global governance is conducted, led by national traitors like Rupert Murdoch, who was given his citizenship in the USA by the CIA and by corrupted banks like the Nugent Hand Bank and corrupted presidents like Gough Whitlam? Well, as I told you, if you look at Elizabeth Murdoch, there came the, uh, the, my research where Elizabeth Murdoch, Rebecca Brooks and Kevin Carhill were directors of Malaria No More. Now, considering Malaria No More, you get, uh, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, was filmed in Australia, which uh, was probably fronted by Rupert Murdoch himself. Um, I saw it as a conflict of interest that a company that uh, was getting 15p of every phone call within that program somehow silted its way back to Elizabeth Murdoch, Rebecca Brooks and Kevin Carhill. Now, as I have informed you... And can we remind the public that <coughs> Rebecca Brooks is also interlocked with General Sir Mike Jackson who brutalised right. the Balkans on behalf of NATO. Well, and what is, did I tell you earlier on about that missing warhead that was said to be transiented through the Balkans? Yeah, they're all in the same team. Well, General Sir Charles Guthrie, yes. another head of, of NATO's armies, who's on the board of NM Rothschild Bank, who is right. stealing from British citizens like it is incredible what they are doing to their own country and well, they're as I, yeah as i told you that with um the uh, the directorships with kevin kyle because of my correspondence with kevin james kyle where i highlighted this uh, that he was the only the only defense witness for andrea davison at her in absence criminal trial where Kevin James Carhill was the advisor to Paddy Ashdown, Gordon Brown, and Lord Laird Artigovan. And I pointed out to Mr. Carhill that he, he, himself and Lord Artigovan both had companies that were directly associated to the boiler rooms that were administered or companies that uh, were administered by Andrea Davison had their origins from, and that was 788-790 Finchley Road, which overviews over 500,000 shell companies. And each time there's a shell company, there's a maybe 25 or a dozen to 25 directors who take a £70,000 salary for being the boss at a scam. That's, That's where our country is. But nobody, nobody in the general public would have done the research that I've done that clearly shows that 788-790 Finchley Road is interlocked with about 25 to 30 other Finchley Road addresses and 788-790 Finchley Road is directly associated to Mohammed Adnan Khashoggi who ran major boiler rooms linked to the covert arms trade for the uh, Iran Contra deal. And so the police, although they've been informed that this address is linked to two, two British companies that asset stripped the American defense budget of over a billion dollars in phantom fuel deliveries to an Afghan uh, NATO airbase called the Manas airbase, and I think uh, you might find reference when I made that research published via Peter Bear's website. Can I just reiterate that Gordon does this for free as a national citizen who has a sense of respect for his own country? It's cool would, you, you, would you, if you were offered it, Gordon, accept a knighthood, knighthood from these people? Only if it came with a free fishing rights to your river. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you'll be able to leverage that until they are convicted and banged up. But we're yeah, getting yeah. closer and closer to that. So the next thing that we want to talk about is... Can I, this can I, 
Uh, can I just add to that thing with the American defense budget? Apparently, it is written that that address, 788790 Finchley Road, is under investigation by the U.S. Senate and those British companies that are fronted by, uh, unfortunately, a, a section of the Jewish community in Finchley, that that same address, 788790 Finchley Road, was used by uh, the Italian Prime Minister, Silvero Bellasconi, and the Mafia for money laundering purposes, and those companies were set up by uh, David Mackenzie Donald Mills, who is the husband of Labour MP Tessa Jowell. And I wrote to M uh, Tessa Jowell asking her for an ex explanation into her husband's involvement with that address, 788 790 Finchley Road. And I do not believe the American inquest will deliver justice for us on the well, basis that the when Berlusconi was in power, the last G8 summit that they held was in Genoa, which is where the man that discovered America allegedly sailed from. That was the year before they brought down the Twin Towers so that they could sweep into Iraq and Afghanistan. They're all in the same team. Only oh, yeah. the people learning what they do to the people will change it when we refuse to comply. But we've gone over our 15-minute time limit. Oh, a lot. So, <laughs> but I'll get that online, and then I'll give okay. you a chance to talk about the massive scams on the stock market in Toronto, in well, Germany. Just, just as a, uh, 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 an entry for this same um, recording, I would like to point out, as you scroll down, a photograph of a young gentleman, Richard Chang, who I have tried to help his, his sister, Jacqueline Chang, with um, forensic documents that clearly show that Kroll Security were in, uh, were actually uh, stationed at the same building, Abbey National Building, when he managed to do a, a, a double somersault half pike uh, onto the, the ground, um, where he was clearly dead before he was thrown, uh, because there was no blood on the scene. Uh, okay, so and the coroner was Freddie Patel. Freddie Patel, yeah. He's been struck off from his profession for frauds that include the killing of an innocent bystander who was drunk at one of the UN protests in London. And this is, this is where my reference to Jacqueline Chang came when I tried to give assistance of understanding the parameters of corporate directors of Kroll, that those two members that I'd mentioned earlier who were in Arlington Associates Limited, and that's James Glen Dining, sorry, Aldwin James Glen Dining Wright, and Mark Blankborough, who worked with Ambassador Francis D. Cook, and Jeffrey White, and David Anthony Lenigas, all directors of the uh, latter being directors of Lonro, which operated out of 22 Arlington Street, next to the, attached to the Ritz. And the of CEO of the Abbey National at that time is the guy with the grin on his face that I'm now pointing at. He so got Stephen bonuses Hector. of 963,000 as, as a top-up to his basic salary. That's Stephen Hester, the yeah, man that Hester. fled the same week as Miliband's brother from this country. Yeah, so why, isn't, why aren't the Financial Services Authority and the Serious Fraud Office looking deeper than the facade of a front and understanding how come people that asset strip a bank of hundreds of billions of pounds are then given and exceptional bonuses. I mean, I'm willing to help them. It's unfortunate uh, that the police don't use this evidence, which is forensic evidence, because it shows possibly how uh, Richard Chang uncovered the corporates that were being uh, allowed to use the bank as a debt facility for virtual companies. And they unfortunately probably found out uh, a little of what I know. So that's another good man who gets it in the head, who's rigor mortosed by the time he hits the deck. Uh, and yes. is his, his sister is a pharmacist like me, 
and I know that she's dedicating her entire lovely. life to clearing his name. Yes, I've met her a few times, a lovely lady, um, and very determined, like myself, to get the truth out to the general public by hook or by crook, and, and to ensure that the general public have a far better understanding of who in politics is uh, uh, really ripping this country to pieces. Thank you for your time, Gordon. We'll get together again later in the week and talk about the banking crash in 2008 and Professor Ewan Brown and many others like him in the academic sectors and in the political sectors who are stealing from our citizens and our students. And you, yes. can, you can get a vent on the AIM systems in London, in Toronto, in Germany, in Australia that are ripping punters off, the ripping investors off, the ripping directors off, and the ripping savers and pensioners off, because they just are involved in cheap shot, shot scams. There is no integrity anywhere in the system, which is why they're picked as politicians. So we'd better close that there, otherwise we're going out of our time limit again. But thank you for your time, and hopefully justice will be done really soon. Right here, George. Tight lines, eh? Bye-bye. <laughs>